everyone. It gives us immense pleasure to have with us today um, Mr. Sanjay Pinto, who through his career seems to have donned many hats across journalism and advocacy and has kindly consented to share his views on the very contemptuous and very contentious topic of contempt of court. So, a slight backdrop about our speaker is before converting to an advocate, where now he specializes in various uh, fields, that is media law, criminal law, constitutional and corporate law, arbitration and consumer forums. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Pinto, our speaker, was the resident editor of NDTV 24-7 and the executive editor of NDTV Hindu. Uh, with many hats to his, uh, many feathers to his hat. He was a legal columnist for the columnist for the Deccan Chronicle and a panelist on multiple debates. Uh, he has also authored three books. Uh, his days in NDTV, Justice for All and Speakers Are Made Not Born. Uh, he is a mentor at the Silver Tongue Academy of Resource. He was the resident. Without further ado, I'm, I'm sorry, I heard something. Anyway, without further ado, I would request uh, our speaker for the day to take it away. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Abhinash. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are many ways that you can spend a Saturday evening listening to a law webinar. Perhaps is not as exciting, so thank you for logging in. During the Second World War, a man was arrested for calling Winston Churchill a fool. Now, quite predictably, the opposition was up in arms. He said it's a police state and so on and so forth. But Churchill retorted with a disarming smile. He said he wasn't arrested for calling the Prime Minister a fool. He was arrested for revealing a national secret at a time of war. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard of fighting fire with fire, but this was perhaps fighting humor with humor or ridicule with sarcasm and wit and innuendo. A few years ago, a legislator in Kerala had lashed out at judges calling them idiots, sitting in glass houses, passing verdicts that have only the value of grass, and if they have any self-respect, they should resign and quit their offices. Now, I'll give you the background, the context to this. This was after the court had clamped down on demonstrations in that state. The matter went to court and deprecating his conduct, the Supreme Court in so-and-so versus High Court of Kerala, found these utterances vitriolic and slanderous with the intention to lower the dignity of the court and to obstruct and to impede its functioning. Such incidents, and I'll come to many more contemporary ones in the course of my lecture, have reopened this debate on our contempt law vis-a-vis -vis free speech, contempt law through the prism of free speech. We all know that a fundamental right is not merely guaranteed, not merely granted to citizens, but guaranteed to citizens. That's the difference between a fundamental right and other rights. And under Article 19.1a, all of us have the right to freedom of speech and expression. So if this statute, and we often hear uh, you know, terms like colonial relic being attributed to the Contempt of Courts Act, saying that it's a colonial hangover and so on and so forth, and that it was meant to gag dissent in the pre-independence era, or at least the mindset, by all means, in that case, let's put it on the chopping block. But we must remember that it was not the British, but the framers of our constitution who thought it fit to not just impose contempt as one of the reasonable restrictions under Article 19.2 to the fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression under Article 19.1a, as I told you, but also empower the Supreme Court under Articles 129 and 142.2, as well as the high courts under Article 215.215 to punish this act. Now, there cannot be much of an objection to civil contempt, which is defined under the statute as under Section 2B uh, of the Contempt of Courts Act of 1971 as willful, willful disobedience of any judgment or willful breach of an undertaking given to the court. It's the wording of criminal contempt, which, as you know, carries imprisonment of up to six months and a fine, that many believe seems too wide. 
Section 2C penalizes communication that scandalizes or tends to scandalize a court, that prejudices or interferes or tends to interfere with judicial proceedings or obstructs or tends to obstruct the administration of justice in any manner. You see the, the nomenclature used here, it's pretty wide. Now, what exactly tends to scandalize or interfere with the, the judiciary is something that we all know could be very subjective, which is why by an amendment in 2006, there was a clause inserted, clause B was inserted in section 16 of the act to allow truth as a valid defense, just like defamation, truth is one of the valid defenses. Under Contempt of Courts Act also, they thought it fit to insert Section uh, 13B to allow truth as a defense, as a valid defense. Now, let's remember that decades ago, the Sanyal Committee had recommended that the burden of proof of any defense should be on the alleged contemnor. But there are riders in this 2006 amendment. What is that rider? The rider lies in ex the expression the court may, let me repeat that, the court may, and that confers a discretion on the judge to either allow or to refuse this defense. The court may allow it or the court may refuse that defense. So the last word, as it were, remains with the court. So many believe that this is not much of a concession, really. This is not much of a, uh, you know, a, an attempt to take away the sting from the act because there's still the discretion, the ultimate uh, Authority remains the judge who's sitting in judgment over the contempt uh, complaint filed. Now, contempt actually earlier, good old days, usually used to be committed by journalists, you know, uh, much before the era of the social media. Now, talking purely about contempt by the mainstream media, as a former television journalist for 15 years, uh, a bureau chief and resident editor, uh, I do believe that the media has a right to not just report. The media also has a right to analyze, to interpret, to investigate happenings in public interest. In public interest, because that freedom of speech and expression is not just an individual right, it extends to viewers. What the, the freedom of speech and expression that the media exercises extends to viewers, it extends to readers. Which is why the framers of this law thought it fit to add Section 3.1 to exempt innocent publication. They thought it fit to add Section 4 to protect fair and accurate reporting of judicial proceedings. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the line must be drawn so that investigation by the mainstream media, by the media, does not stray into adjudication. That is a domain of the courts and the courts alone. So this is something that has to be borne in mind by our media friends. But as I said earlier, uh, most of the contempt today is committed not by the mainstream media, but by sections of the social media, and I'll come to that later. Now, contrary to public popular belief, the goal of contempt is not really to just insulate judges from criticism, uh, but to prevent erosion of public confidence in the administration of justice. It's not that a judgment cannot be criticized. A judgment is assailed all the time. Every time you file an appeal, you assail a judgment. So while a judgment is passed and it can be assailed, or as Jeremy Bentham so beautifully put it, it's given over to criticism. It's given over to criticism. Personal motives cannot be attributed to a judge. You may attack the judgment, but you cannot attack the judge. No personal motives. Now, how does one distinguish a personal motive from attacking the judgment? How does one make a distinction between this courtesy from scandalizing the court? The Supreme Court in that Mulgaukar landmark case had laid down certain guidelines on what it called punitive action for contempt. The courts, the Apex Court felt, were to adopt a broad-shouldered approach, you know, pretty much like the dogs bark, but the caravan will pass on. That sort of an approach harsh criticism of their decisions. However, it said unfounded attacks on judges calculated to destroy the judicial process cannot be ignored. No unfounded attacks on judges. There's a definite no-no even in that landmark Mulgaukar case. Now, much later, you know, the Supreme Court in the Narmada Bachao Andolan versus Union of India uh, decision had reaffirmed this thinking. 
this thinking that while hypersensitivity and peevishness have just no place in judicial proceedings vicious stultification vulgar debunking cannot be permitted to pollute the stream of justice now ladies and gentlemen this principle of erosion of public confidence i mean it's a fancy term you might imagine what exactly is this principle of erosion of public confidence what exactly leads to public confidence taking a hit by acts of contempt this was tested in the arundhati roy case where they felt that an affidavit is also deemed publication because it's a public record the supreme court held that it is no defense to say that no actual damage has been done to the judiciary uh, and that the proceedings may drop just because it's an affidavit and here the court in fact uh, you know in classic prose it laid down a beautiful proposition a beautiful proposition of law that it punishes the archer as soon as the arrow is shot even if it misses the target let me repeat that for you it punishes the archer as soon as the arrow is shot even if it misses the target a justice frankfurter of the united states supreme court had summed up the law of contempt against the backdrop of fair comment in his in his trademark uh, inimitable witty fashion he said if men including judges and journalists those days before the social media of course were angels there would be no problem there would be no issue of contempt because angelic judges would be undisturbed by extraneous influences and angelic journalists would not seek to influence them the power to punish for contempt of court is a safeguard not for judges as persons but for the function which they exercise so if you see there's a common thread that runs through all these decisions of uh, of our superior judiciary and of uh, great thinkers jurists that there is a distinction between making an attack personal attack on a judge and attacking the institution uh, that they represent the judiciary that we are all in a way part of now i for one believe i mean the part of uh, you know the idea of of organizing a lecture is not just to give you what's there in textbooks or what's there in case law but to give you the speaker's opinion especially when you call a journalist turned uh, lawyer you know we expect a very opinionated argumentative soul out there uh, i'm not going to disappoint you i for one believe ladies and gentlemen that criticism need not breed contempt let me say that again criticism need not breed contempt but what exactly is criticism is something that i will tell you let me give you a uh, recent example so a tale of i call it i written about it in my column as well the technical a tale of two tweets where there was no contempt and it augured well for free speech okay this was uh, uh, our own madras uh, high court our former uh, chief justice uh, honorable justice ap sai this was the case of actor surya kumar sivu kumar tweets uh, he had tweeted uh, you know on courts delivering justice through video conferencing but ordering students to fearlessly go and write the neat exam okay so madras high court this particular case took what they call that broad shoulder shouldered approach casting aside those critical comments uh, by in fact two public figures i'll come to the second one later this first of course was surya sivakumar tweets it passed an erudite 29 page order and the court reasoned that a constitutional court need not use a sledge hammer need not use a sledge hammer to deal with a statement that had merely raised a storm in a teacup i mean such maturity such magnanimity such grace really augurs well for our judiciary and, and hats off to justice ap sai who had who had authored uh, that particular judgment uh, i don't know how many of the critics of the judiciary even were aware that justice ap sai in the in the course of his duty had contracted corona had gone to a government hospital got cured there and returned to work after that i mean some of these things it's very easy to uh you know to take a politically correct stance and try and attack the judiciary and sound clever but these are real instances that somehow are swept under the carpet by uh by intellectuals now in the other instance uh, this involved a former uh, senior colleague of mine uh, in ntv rajdeep uh, sardesai who remains a good friend uh 
uh, a quietus was given to a contempt plea moved in the Supreme Court against him. Uh, he had made some comment about Prashant Bhushan case, saying that the court had, uh, you know, wriggled out of embarrassment and all that. Now, this is very interesting here. You had an, an, an uncle nephew duo. You had Attorney General Mr. K K Venugopal uh, in that case, who had opined that you know because you know that under uh, uh, under Section 15 of the Contempt of Courts Act, you need uh, you know uh, consent of uh, the, uh, the the Attorney General, the Center, or the uh, the Advocate General of the State. Uh, uh, go ahead. I mean, while the court can take so moto action as well, there's another procedure where you go through consent. It's like a check and a balance there. But Mr. K K Venugopal, the AG, opined that. Rajdeep tweets did not undermine the majesty of the Supreme Court. He took a very mature overall picture of the tweets, examined them, and this is the opinion he gave. Supreme Court accepted it. The same way, his nephew, our Tamil Nadu Advocate General Vijay Narayanan, took a similar stance on Actor Surya's statement, and therefore you found that was given a quietus, that was given a decent burial, and no further controversy. That's the kind of magnanimity that. The courts can exercise, uh, and the courts can rise above some of these uh, critical comments made by people who may not be experts. That that's really the problem with our country. Everybody is an expert. Everybody likes to comment on everything, or not just how the judiciary should function, how the batsman should have played that particular shot, how the doctor should be doing, what they should be doing with the uh, the corona in the ICU, and all kinds of things. Everybody likes to have an opinion. Nothing wrong, but uh, sometimes you have to be a little restrained in public interest at least. Now, as I mentioned earlier. The power of the Supreme Court and High Courts that flows from from Articles 129 and, and 215 of the Constitution to punish citizens for contempt under Section 2C, uh, criminal contempt, must ideally be sparingly used. What amounts exactly to scandalizing the court, or what is prejudicial to or interference with a judicial proceeding, or an obstruction to the administration of justice, is a grey area. A lot of people say they seem to lay the blame at the judges' uh, table, buck stops there for uh, judicial delays. But what about lawyers who seek a lot of adjournments? What about the biggest litigant in the country, the government? So who contributes? It's 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 collective blame, if at all. It's not just the judges who are responsible for a docket explosion or for judicial delays. There are several other relevant stakeholders there. So it has to be collective blame, if at all. Now, very interestingly, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in 2006, that uh, amendment, which I spoke about, to permit truth as a valid defense, came as I told you with that inherent judicial discretion of the words the court may permit in Section 13B of the statute. I see some of you have joined just now, so I'm just repeating that. In 2006, there was an amendment to insert Section 13B in the Contempt of Courts Act to allow truth as a valid defense. Now, what is our motto of justice? Satya Meva Jayate. You also have Yato Dharmastato Jaya in our High Courts and the Supreme Court, respectively. Does this element of discretion come across then as incongruous with our motto? This is not my view, or rather, this is not just my view. This was a question raised by the National Commission to review the working of the Constitution in 2002. Now, very often in the context of these, uh, you know, uh, restrictions that are placed on free speech. We know that there are close to nine, ten reasonable restrictions under Article 19. To uh, if they are to be very stringently viewed and implemented, would they remain reasonable? You know, I'm reminded of uh, uh, you know word, the words of Leo Tolstoy who once said, "I sit on a man's back, choking him and forcing me to carry him, and yet assure myself and others that I am sorry for him, and I wish to lighten his burden by all possible means." Except by getting off his back. So, can you have so many reasonable restrictions to free speech under Article 19.2, and can they remain reasonable? These are questions I'm, I'm, I'm uh, throwing up to you to actually mull over. If you take a hard line on all these riders, I am just wondering whether this fundamental right guaranteed to all of us under Article 19.1a that we so, you know, greatly cherish, whether they would be subjected to A chilling effect. Worse, would they end up being consigned to a deep freezer? These are questions many of you, our law students, should contemplate as you study the Constitution. Now, very interestingly, observations of the Privy Council that were quoted in a Supreme Court decision in 
Aswini Kumar Ghosh versus Arvinda Bose in 1953. These are very, very instructive. And I quote from the judgment. The path of criticism is a public way. The wrong-headed are permitted to err therein, provided that members of the public stain from imputing improper motives to those taking part in the administration of justice and are genuinely exercising a right of criticism and not acting in malice or attempting to impair the administration of justice. Justice is not a cloistered virtue. She must be allowed to suffer the scrutiny and respect, even though outspoken comments of ordinary men. Scrutiny and respectful, though outspoken comments of ordinary men. Now, these ordinary men will wonder if things other than critical comments would scandalize the court. For instance, as I mentioned earlier, like inordinate judicial delays, like judgments reserved for which the apex court in Anil Rai versus State of Bihar had lamented, was a stark reality. Like advocates who are officers of the court not given a fair hearing. Sometimes I wonder. Instead of actually doing away with the Contempt of Courts Act, maybe we need some more legislations to infuse greater public confidence in the functioning of our courts, where, for instance, lawyers are given a fair hearing, a certain minimum fair hearing for their cases to be heard, rather than just being dismissed uh, you know, in a few seconds. Imagine the, the litigants who would have traveled uh, far and wide to hear their cases, and finally they find their cases. It's, it's obviously possible that the judges have read their papers before coming in, so they don't need to waste time. But sometimes at least they say justice should not only be done, but also seem to be done. So perhaps some, uh, some legislation to ensure that lawyers who represent their cases are given a, a, a certain minimum hearing before the cases are dismissed at least. Now, what has really led to, why is, this, why is contempt of court act still topical, still an evergreen topic? Today? That's because there has been, in my opinion, an upward trend when it comes to criticism, perhaps scandalizing the judiciary as well. Now, this gradual rise in content that is critical, that, uh, you know, that uh, castigates our judiciary stems from two or three factors. Two of these are paradoxical. The first factor, ladies and gentlemen, is that, and I, I'm sure all of you will agree, that the judiciary no matter what, is still seen as a last ray of hope by the common citizens. The judiciary is that last bastion of hope. There can be no two opinions about that. Secondly, that there is a level of disappointment, of disenchantment over certain decisions and the manner of functioning of the judiciary. Why? Because it is seen, and this is a perception that has been gaining ground, a perception that is not entirely without merit, I would say. Uh, but it cannot be, there cannot be broad brushing. I don't think you can broad brushing, you indulge in broad brushing by one or two instances which are hyped. But by and large, people seem to believe okay, whether it's right or wrong, this is something for us to analyze and for you to decide after listening to this lecture and doing your own research and coming to your own conclusions. That the system, the system, the system is not just the judges, the system is all the players that the system seems to favor A-listers and the system comes down hard on dissenters in the current climate in our country. And thirdly, those are the two paradoxical factors I gave you. Thirdly, the influence and reach of the social media as a barometer of public opinion, social media. Now, are A-listers more equal than dissenters? When I ask, this, ask myself this question, this is, this is a stark example, example that comes to my mind. The example of an 83-year-old Jesuit priest, Father Stan Swami, who has been still moving a court to get a straw and a sipper. I mean, like he got, ultimately he got a straw and a sipper much later that day. day. But of course, his bail is still uh, pending. He had to wait for so long to get a straw and a sipper because he had Parkinson's and he could not hold a cup in his hands. He had Parkinson's among a plethora of other ailments. The prosecution then sought three weeks' time to respond whether he needs a, to give a person, an 83-year-old man, a straw and a sipper in prison. What does that say about our respect for human rights? For the record, Parkinson's figures in the list of specified disabilities as a chronic neurological condition under Clause 482, small 2, 
of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. Even if he is kept in a dispensary in prison, does he have barrier-free access as mandated by Section 25.1BB of the statute? These are questions that one is entitled to ask. I am not really in a position to go into the merits of the case against Father Stan Swami or other activists, uh, but who have been charged under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Uh, but they do call for thorough investigation. There's no doubt about that. But that's not really the point. The comparison was made between Father Stan Swami's case and another former colleague of mine, Ornab uh, Goswami's case, Ornab Manoranjan Goswami versus State of Maharashtra 2020. You know, it was widely reported. Where the Supreme Court is reported to have, to have uh, observed that, and I quote, if we as a constitutional court do not lay down the law and protect liberty, then who will? Constitutional courts have to protect freedom or they will be walking down a path of destruction. We need to send a message to the high courts as well to exercise their jurisdiction to uphold personal liberty, unquote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the moot question is uh, very pertinent observations by, by the Supreme Court there. But the moot question remains is whether that enforcement of fundamental rights under Article 226 or Article 32 of the Constitution before the High Courts or the Supreme Court is relatively quicker for the well healed compared to the poor and the relatively powerless. Is it relatively quicker for the well healed, for the rich and famous, compared to the poor? and the relatively helpless, powerless citizens of our country. Ditto with the right to, against deprivation of life and liberty, except according to procedure established by law under Article 21 of the Constitution or equal protection under Article 14 of the Constitution. Now, I for one believe that threats to personal liberty do not go by a calendar of working days and vacations. You know, this whole thing of... Uh, uh, not thank God it's Friday, but uh, dread that it's Friday. You know, people arresting this concept of arresting people on Friday so that they will not be able to get bail immediately. You know, that itself, the moment somebody is summoned to a police station on a Friday, uh, they, they, they shiver in their shoes. Okay. Uh, why is that? There's a difference between a real right and one that exists only on paper. That, you know, that, 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 that distinction should lie in expeditious listing and compassionate hearing based on merit and not based on the status of the petitioners or the standing of the high-profile lawyers who represent them. I mean, that is something that uh, we have to really ponder over. And much has been written and spoken about due process of law. You know, you would hear this so often. In fact, the term that has become today a cliche almost, bail, not jail, it was first used about 44 years ago by the erudite Justice B. R. Krishnayar in State of Rajasthan versus Balchand, 1977. The basic rule, and I quote from Justice Krishnayar's uh, seminal verdict on the point, the basic rule may perhaps be tersely put as bail, not jail, except where there are circumstances suggestive of fleeing from justice or thwarting the course of justice or creating other trouble in the shape of repeating offenses or intimidating witnesses. This phrase, as I said, has become quite hackneyed, but does it prevail on the ground? Does it prevail on the ground? Another equally old but uh, you know uh, landmark and relevant decision that i'd like to uh, you know bring to your attention arguably the first public interest litigation filed in india was by the supreme court in Husainara cartoon versus state of bihar 1979 Husainara cartoon versus state of bihar now, in that case uh, the court had lamented that under trials were treated as mere ticket numbers ticket numbers and the court thundered against that backdrop. And I quote, it is a crying shame on the judicial system which permits incarceration of men and women for such long periods of time without trial. Are expeditious trial and freedom from detention not part of human rights and basic freedoms? It is high time that the public conscience is awakened and the government as well as the judiciary begin to realize that in the dark cells of our prisons, there are large numbers of men and women who are waiting patiently, impatiently perhaps, but in vain, for justice, a commodity which is tragically beyond their reach and grasp. Law has become for them an instrument of injustice, and they are helpless and despairing victims of the callousness of the legal and judicial system. Unquote. Not my words. 
but the words of the honorable apex court of this country more than four decades on i ask you ladies and gentlemen to put your hands across your hearts and tell me who gets timely adjudication and who feels abdication who gets timely adjudication and who feels abdication this is for you to decide now there have been several high profile contempt cases in the the recent past the prashant bhushan case for instance where prashant bhushan had uh, tweeted uh, he had tweeted that i quote democracy he said was destroyed in india without even a formal emergency he tweeted that particularly uh, you know uh, it marks the role of the supreme court particularly the role of the last four chief justices then in another tweet uh, there was a picture of uh, the chief justice uh, sitting on a uh, on a 50 he said uh, rides a 50 lakh motorcycle belonging to a bjp leader raj bhavan nagpur without a mask or a helmet when he keeps the supreme court in lockdown mode denying citizens their fundamental right to justice this was what prashant bhushan had tweeted it come up it had come up for a lot of scrutiny and ultimately you know how that uh, ended uh, a one rupee fine was uh, imposed on him of course he's gone under review i wouldn't like to really comment on this matter because it's still subjudice in a sense that review is still pending and um that's something that uh, i'd leave for the courts to ultimately decide uh, but then there was another case after that of stand up comedian kunal kamra who made certain controversial tweets one on the supreme court swayed in saffron with a bjp flag he even uh, uh, put a picture of a finger he said middle finger depicting uh, you know a judge and he made snide remarks uh, references to arnab goswami's tail uh, then he compared a judge to an aircraft cabin crew serving uh, business class passengers champagne and all that now that must be seen against this background kunal kamra has to date i just checked before this uh, lecture 1.9 million followers on twitter how many 1.9 billion followers on twitter that is several several times more than the circulation of a newspaper most newspapers will have about 3 or 4 lakhs uh, readers 1.9 billion followers so he may be a stand up comedian but he's got a tremendous sphere of influence in the public space the public mind space now kunal kamra refused to back down when there was a contempt notice filed uh, a contempt complaint filed the, the attorney general mr kk venugopal gave consent uh, to uh, try him under the contempt law kamra actually uh, filed a 11 and 11 page affidavit uh, which was again widely headlined in the media uh the headline was incarcerated artists and flourishing laptops in fact he takes a swipe at the judiciary he also takes a swipe at the mainstream media yes it was seen as combative uh even to the point of being irreverential and sarcastic i'm going to read a uh, certain portions from his uh, affidavit the suggestion kunal kamra writes in his affidavit suggestion that my tweets could shake the foundation of the most powerful court in the world is an overestimation of my abilities just as the supreme court values the faith that the public places in it and seeks to protect it by the exercise of its contempt jurisdiction it should also trust the public not to form its opinions of the court on the basis of a few jokes on twitter now ladies and gentlemen as a lawyer as an officer of the court i do not subscribe to i do not like unfair and derogatory comments on our judiciary let me be very clear about that i do not take uh, take that uh, lying down i think there is a certain semblance of respect that we need to give institutions it's not just judges in their personal capacity but judges representing the judiciary which we all represent as i said as officers of the court yes the judiciary does have its flaws it does have its weaknesses like every other institution but it reminds me of what jesus christ once told a crowd of protesters who were about to lynch a lady he said he who has not sinned pick up the first stone he who has not sinned pick up the first stone i am proud to belong to the legal profession but at the same time i also recognize the need for reforms and the contempt law i feel needs to keep up with the times the contempt law definitely needs certain reforms certain tweaking uh, you know lord denning and i have great respect uh, and a great admiration for lord uh, denning you know uh, who had quipped uh, let me say at once that we will never use this jurisdiction he meant contempt jurisdiction as a means to uphold our own dignity that must rest on sure foundations nor will we use it to suppress those who speak against us we do not fear criticism 
nor do we resent it. Exposed as we are to the winds of criticism, nothing which is said by this person or that, nothing which is written by this pen or that, will deter us from doing what we believe is right. So I was wondering when I was going through Lord Denning's work, when he spoke about resting on surer foundations, whether he sounded like Kunal Kamra to some extent, to a limited extent. You know, finally, uh, you know, I, I for one believe that an estate of democracy that is meant to uphold the fundamental rights of citizens can be strengthened by criticism. An estate of democracy can also rise above criticism. But what exactly is criticism? A lot of people make this fundamental error here. They think that abuse is dissent and scurrilous allegations and attacks are criticism. That is not criticism. I don't think the judiciary would fight shy of genuine constructive criticism. But scurrilous allegations, personal attacks, you know, uh, vulgar commentary. I don't think showing a middle finger uh, to the Chief Justice of India can be anything but vul vulgar. I don't think, I do not stand for that at all. I mean, it's not a question of coming up with intelligent prose later on. That is something that we cannot stand for. Yes, you have a right to criticize judgments. You have a right to criticize the functioning of the courts. But you cannot demean an estate of democracy in that manner. You may disagree with anyone, but there's a, there's a way of disagreeing. You, cannot, you can disagree without being disagreeable. Finally, I'd like to leave you with my, with my personal take that a contempt law does need tweaking. But I believe, as we stand today, with the social media in full flow, that it is a necessary deterrent. Free speech, oh yes. Free for all, no. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was indeed enlightening and uh, riddled with some legal principles and some useful anecdotes. But uh, it does bring to light something. You seem to be you seem to be bordering on on you seem to be bordering on stating that the media has powers which can fall under the garb of criticism. Anyway, before asking my question, I'll throw the floor open to questions from the others and. Uh, Hopefully, someone, anyone who you want to ask the question first, I'll answer that. And uh... my question is simple: There are people on prime time. Uh, some people at 9 p.m. who speak on behalf of India. Then there are other people who speak on behalf of the left and the liberals. They coin their, they they give themselves these tags, they give themselves these medals to boost their TRPs. And at the end of the day, to get that TRP, they sensationalize every debate. And ir and inevitably in once every three debates or once every four debates, you have someone questioning a court judgment or the manner in which a court functions. And as, as you rightly pointed out, when Kunal Kamra has such reach, the visual media has a greater reach if you go by the TRP ratings that they state. There is no regulation in place yet to ensure that people who appear on these shows or people who moderate these shows in whichever manner they do so, there's no regulation on how they should act and how they should proceed. So when they proceed to make statements which in fact lower the or have, in, have a tendency to lower the image of the judiciary as a whole, like the statements which have been made against CGI Bobre, I won't go into the fact whether I support the statement or not. But considering the post, can such statements be made in the first place? Because as you rightly pointed out, the framers of the constitution never knew there would be Twitter or Facebook or there would be news which would be aired live to someone. You know, Avinash, I wonder how many reasonable restrictions we could have had in that case that the social media existed back then. <laughs> no, but I think you, you flagged a very valid concern, uh, you know, a, a justifiable apprehension. But I think, I don't think there are too many panelists on prime time debates who have actually been hauled up for contempt, as there are social media users who have been hauled up. Uh, both Mr. Prashant Bhushan's case stemmed from a tweet, Kunal Kamra's case, and there was another activist whose uh, tweets were actually called into question. Uh, you raised an important point about regulation. At least in the media, you have an editor of a TV channel, you have editors, there's some kind of vetting that can go on. Of course, in live, in a live telecast, it's not possible to edit. In fact, I was part of a, a case where, uh, you know, a criminal defamation case was filed. And we had argued that it's not possible to edit what is live. That was the only case in point. But there is no regulation. Talk of regulation, you'll be trolled. Right now, if you think you'll be trolled on the social media, uh, Avinash Vadwani, you'll, be, you'll have a hashtag. Okay. Uh, there is no regulation on the social media. Regulation need not be such a bad thing. Okay, who, 
as lawyers we are regulated by bar council doctors are regulated by medical council advertisers have the advertising standards council of india insurance companies have the irda chartered accountants have their own regulatory bodies okay every profession has some kind of regulation but the social media has nothing i can create a, a, a fictitious account a twitter handle in the name of abhinash vadwani and start abusing people so there's no authentication or even recently you had this uh, you know the online uh, regulation that came up uh, you know I, i think it's still not addressed the problem of anonymity on the social media and that anonymity actually emboldens people to make irresponsible remarks and and try and get away with it and the moment they say something and they are hauled up then they try to play martyr okay i'm all for people exercising their views without fear or favor we are after all a democracy but as i said there has to be responsible exercise of that right that is my uh, that's my point so i'm sorry i'm sorry for a slight difference where i believe that you have answered the social media aspect of it but how do you address uh, channels or visual media which continue to host debates which at the end of the day are regulated by their own forum it is not a statutory forum which regulates them there is self regulation there and even that self regulation is not working in this my opinion uh, you saw that even for instance during the death of uh, of celebrities like uh, when the actress sri devi died you had this bathtub journalism reconstructions all kinds of things i can put to you select specific uh, you know the self regulation uh, reg- regulatory codes which were violated like they cannot have reconstruction you cannot have uh, these props and all that uh, you cannot uh, you know uh, violate certain norms of sensitivity and decency now all that is by it violated so even self regulation is not working which is why we have to have some like the press council press council doesn't apply to uh, to the visual media you have the national broadcasters association you need to give them more teeth so that they'll be able to beyond censor they'll be able to take some action against these people so i'm sorry i'll i'll be a little more specific I, as i was hosting it i didn't want to be so specific but what do you say about the media trial which was held in justice loya's case or for that matter when i post the ayodhya verdict there were two sides determining both of them who were uh, if i may say abysmally unqualified to even talk about how it goes on speculating and throwing doubt upon the judgment passed by the apex court so don't you think these people should be held up for contempt including the editor who decided that should be the topic for the day no i don't think you can say there cannot be vicarious liability here see the editor as i said you cannot edit what is live you call a set of panelists and you're not necessarily putting words in their mouth if those panelists go astray then they need to face the music themselves that's why most of them have a disclaimer that uh, it is not their views okay so you cannot call up the editor in this case an editor yeah it is possible that you get certain people who are aligned to a certain view and and uh, and rile them up during the show and make them say certain things that's possible okay but uh, yeah you make a point there but i don't think you can you can loop in the editor here in this case unless the editor is also hosting the show and other, unless the editor asks those live those leading questions almost forcing people to take a certain line cutting off those who take an you know a, a contrary view that that you know happens the way it is uh, managed yeah i think mr sanjay i hope to yes Once yes vignesh uh, addendum to what you said i think uh, recently the government has also come up with uh, social media guidelines or the It's called the Information Technology Guidelines for Intermediaries and Digital Media Ethics Code Rules 2021. Yes. Which, you know, probably talks about uh, some kind of uh, uh, regulation that all these social media platforms need to undergo. But I think again, uh, one of the uh, writ has been filed before the Supreme Court in terms of testing the validity. I think one of uh, our uh, members i mean uh, in terms of uh, from the legal fraternity live law has gone before the uh, kerala high court and uh, another forum before uh, the supreme court so i think in terms of that we are i mean trying to get uh, these regulated but i would really uh, be uh, interested to know what your take would be on uh, these intermediary or social media guidelines specifically in the context of yeah i will i will uh, practice what i preach and since a matter of subjects i won't directly uh, you know get delve into that subject but as i said i think a certain amount of regulation is definitely necessary given the way the social media is increasingly turning anti social today okay i think the social media has been used to great to good effect as for instance you have handles like blood aid if somebody needs blood to tweet to blood donors india within seconds you will get offer so the social media can be used as such a tool of empowerment uh, most government agencies today have redressal through the social media 
So the social media can do a lot of good. At the same time, you have these anonymous handles, you have these bots, you have these trolls. They need to actually, you know, you need to come down on them because they actually almost scare away those who have an opinion. And they, on the one hand, they talk about free speech. The other hand, they pounce like a pack of wolves on those who take a contrarian view. And as I said, the line between dissent and abuse is blurred. Uh, I am yet to see any that the aspect of anonymity being addressed by these social media rules. Anonymity, I think they, they, they have not really addressed that particular uh, aspect. Where you should have some kind of, like, if you want to start a newspaper today, uh, you, you have to go before a magistrate and make a declaration. If you want a mobile phone connection, you have to give proof of address uh, and proof of identity. They like even come and take your fingerprints and your iris scan and all that. But to start a social media account, what's the authentication that you require? Zilch. Okay, so these are aspects that I think have been uh, left out for some reason. These are aspects that have been left out in, in those rules. It'd be interesting to see what I think Live Law definitely has a point. I, I mean, I, I'm a great fan of uh, Live Law and Bar and Bench, and I think they've changed the way legal reporting has come, and most of us get all our updates uh, to these uh, websites. Um, so I, I'd be interested to see what really comes out of it. Uh, as long as, yes, they do have a point about, you know, a chilling effect on, on free speech and clamping down on the online uh, on the online sections of the media. Uh, that, I think, will be interesting to see what comes out of it. But as far as regulation for the social media per se, I'm not talking about web online sites. I think online sites, many of them are doing a great job. Many of them are speaking truth to power today. They're speaking truth to power when large sections are being seen as uh, cheerleaders. Uh, their freedom of speech and expression, which extends to viewers, must be upheld, must be protected. But scandalous, vitriolic, venomous tweets that are spewed on the social media, uh, they need to stop and they need to be regulated so that we can have a, you know, a healthy discourse. We can have a healthy, civilized, dignified discourse on the social media. I may, uh, Vignesh and I may not see eye to eye on certain issues that we just discussed, but I don't, I'm not calling him names, neither is he calling me names. Right? So we can have a healthy, decent discourse uh, in our country. Thank you so much. Uh, Welcome. Welcome. Seems to be a question from Mr. Setu as to yeah. why is the punishment for civil criminal contempt of court so less? Up to six months simple imprisonment or 2,000 rupees fine. Sometimes the offenders accused are released on written apology. What is your view on this? Uh, he has a point there. You know, probably what he means is the lack of deterrence uh, that, you know, for six months. In fact, many cases, even in the first case where he called judges idiots and value of grass and all that. Uh, Supreme Court had actually commuted that to uh, four weeks of simple imprisonment in that particular case. Uh, but this itself, uh, you know, people are up in arms over this itself. So, yes, maybe a little more deterrence uh, would help. But then there's such a public uproar the moment someone is, uh, because immediately any action taken for contempt of court is seen as an affront to free speech. Need not be the case. So immediately there are people who play martyr. It doesn't mean that uh, the court should uh, be completely immune, should uh, completely... Uh, uh, you know, stand on a certain pedestal that nobody, you know, touch me on kind of approach. But as I said, any scandalous attack must be dealt with. I kind of, uh, I'm a little on the fence here uh, because I don't believe that we need to make it more stringent. Deterrence, yes, but not necessarily more stringent. I think the six-month uh, imprisonment thing is more than adequate for now. My view. Any other questions since the floor is open? When he says, thanks a lot for your answer, sir, it makes it so different from the social media. Because when I said this on the social media, I would have, I would have been called names. So this is, this is what I call dignified interface. He asks a question, I give my opinion, respect it or you disagree with it, but you still thank me for the answer. If only we could have this the webinar culture spill over to the social media. Any other questions from anyone? So I don't think there are any other questions. Uh, thank you so much for... Uh, you can actually ask them to unmute. Uh, maybe they want to unmute and ask. If somebody wants to unmute and ask, you're welcome. Yeah. Nobody will be hauled up for contempt for raising a question. I believe you're over 55, sir. Uh, sorry? 
I believe you are over fifty-five. Barred by the second judge's case. Ah, uh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh... I said I believe you are over fifty-five. Therefore, you are outside the zone of consideration. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> So I think everyone is in a Saturday evening mode. Yeah. So it just means it's an unquestionable performance. They, they don't. Yeah. yeah of course. <laughs> But I will. I will reserve my rights on uh, your uh, colleague. I heard you mention his name, a senior colleague from NDTV. Two. Oh, I mentioned two of them. Uh, Mr. Rajdeep. Okay. Don't you think sometimes his uh, performances border on the on the zone of contempt, like on a personal level? Actually, I have a lot of respect for Rajdeep. Uh, you know, I think he's one of the best television journalists around here. Uh, he's a leader who leads by example. Uh, see again, the stand that you take. Uh, you know, in today's deeply polarized uh, society that we live in, should you be politically correct or politically accurate? I believe Rajdeep is politically accurate, not politically correct, and therefore. he has his share of uh, critics and he has a share of fans i happen to be somebody who respects him i may not agree with all his views but then that really is the beauty of democracy right anyway sir thank you so much for taking time out it was a pleasure to hear you on a topic which spanned over different aspects of contempt of how social media vis a vis courts and how freedom of expression all merged into one it was lucid clear and a well spent saturday evening if i may say so thank you thank you that's very uh, very encouraging thank you avinash thank you vignesh for putting this together and uh, uh, i know you wanted me to speak on on uh, media trial but that's been done and dusted beaten to death almost so i kind of suggest to namastang shrimati for actually putting me on to you and shrimati has been following up persistent persistently And I'm glad we were able to do this on a Saturday. So I thank all the. There are about I think 83 participants right now. Uh, some are even waiting to join. But, uh, I thank all these participants. Many of them, I believe, are law students. Uh, you know, this really is a great boon. I mean, webinars for you to actually interact with uh, professionals. Uh, and I thank the colleges for sending them. But this was, I'm sure, not a captive audience. Uh, Any way of uh, these people getting certificates or something? I'm just asking out. Uh, Some incentive for them? Is it possible at all? Uh, English is very well. Not move there yet. Get certified. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making life difficult for you, but just an idea, just a eureka moment uh, thought. Great, great. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank, th thanks to all of you for tuning in. Thank you.